hello guys welcome back to the channel and in our part six of our road to quantum field theory we will be talking about poisson brackets and commutators so that sounds like a lot of jargon but in our last part of our road to quantum field theory we mentioned that particularly Werner Heisenberg came with this um, way of thinking about quantum mechanics called the matrix formalism of quantum mechanics now uh, he did indeed um, work with a lot of linear algebra to kind of derive things in regards to um, quantum mechanics but in particular it was um, Paul Dirac who kind of um, used this um, more fanciful notation and way of going about things called like commutators and using commutators in the regime of quantum mechanics now of course you might not know precisely what that um, those particular words entail though if you know a little bit of quantum mechanics then you might have seen those already but regardless Regardless, I will treat this as a nice entry basically into what commutators are in terms of quantum mechanics. But before that, I have been thinking and wondering as to how we're going to introduce quantum mechanics in our playlist for our road to quantum field theory. Since there were there are a lot of ways I could have gone about this, like either throwing the Schrodinger equation in there or like doing something else with like bracket notation immediately, like a lot of books do. Um, but I thought what might be the best way of going about this and um, after doing a bit of a little bit of reading I found that the best way of going about this is showing how um, you could say quantum mechanics the idea behind it at least um, can um, be seen as not too far off from classical mechanics or some ideas from classical mechanics since if you look hard enough you'll find that especially the idea of commutators which becomes really important later down the road um, can actually be analogous to something in classical mechanics known as Poisson brackets so we will explore Poisson brackets and um, this notion from classical mechanics so a good portion of the video will actually be exploring this concept of classical mechanics in order to kind of show you how it appears to be very similar to the quantum mechanical equivalent of this same concept you could say um, so without further ado, we will go into Poisson brackets, but before doing so, I'd like to thank you again for being here on our road to quantum field theory. I hope you're enjoying this. If you've been from part one to part five with me, um, I hope these videos are clear because I try my best. It's not just for me, um, but it's also to try and help you guys who are also on the same road from being a bachelor student to gradually understanding these more difficult concepts. Um, so to give you an overview, as I do have a nice concise plan now as to how I'm going to go about the rest of this playlist, at least up till group theory portions, I'm going to give you an overview as to what the next parts are going to entail. So this part, part six, is going to be about Poisson brackets and commutators. And specifically, I'm going to talk especially about the Hamiltonian mechanics, the version of um, classical mechanics, which was formed by Hamilton and kind of um, generalizes even the Lagrangian way of going about things into a more general way using things like generalized um, coordinates and generalized momentum. We will talk about those soon. So that's for this part. Part seven is going to be be on the Dirac notation operators or observables um, and the uncertainty principle so we're gonna look at the bracket notation especially like how we work with bracket notation and simple stuff about it um, also observables like what does it mean to um, actually observe something um, that is a quantum mechanical system so that is going to entail things like normalizing the wave function to find the probability distribution of um, whatever observable you're interested in in measuring as well as calculating things like the expectation value so it's going to be a very hands-on like calculation type of um, thing but hopefully not too tedious um, and, and on top of that we will talk about the uncertainty principle now notice how I didn't say the Heisenberg uncertainty principle because we are going to derive that but we're also going to see how you can derive the uncertainty principle between any observables just by using the commutators which we'll learn about in this part um, 
Um, so the generalized uncertainty principle is more powerful and more effective to get out of the way right out of the bat. Um, so that's for part seven. Part eight um, will be on uh, stationary states and the Schrodinger equation. So there we will talk about um, eigenfunctions in general, which are these really important things in quantum mechanics. As one of the postulates of quantum mechanics is that you can describe um, all of the different states you can observe your quantum system to be in um, as this linear combination of um, eigenfunctions which at the end of the day build something called a stationary state um, depending on whether it's time dependent or time independent nuances will be filled in the future but we will talk basically all about wave functions and um, basically their implications and um, specifically some of the nitty-gritty things about them and also how you can solve one of the simplest um, ways of the of solving the Schrodinger equation and that is for harmonic oscillators which would be the most relevant when it comes to eventually Actually, firstly tackling some QFT types of things. So that's for part eight. Part nine will be on um, angular momentum and spin. So there we will look at um, the operator equivalents of classical um, dynamical variables like angular momentum and also spin, which classically would be things like an object rotating around its axis or its moments of inertia. But in quantum mechanics, especially as things are weird, you have um, quantum mechanical systems which have this internal symmetry going on, which means that they have a spin you could say um built in you could say um property of them while they're not actually physically spinning since um sometimes or a lot of times you represent particles as these dimensionless point like things so it's weird but it works we will see why in the future so we will definitely talk about angular momentum and spin in the quantum mechanical context as well as things like addition of angular momentum i don't know if i'm going to go into really a lot of the deep end with clapsch gordon coefficients since that has its place in the future but we will just talk about that those two particular things after that, in part 10, we will cover um, many body quantum systems. So we will talk about um, identical particles as I have um, talked about, for example, in this video, although that recent video was meant to be a general video for people who just want to see some cool quantum mechanics as I recently learned about that and it was very, very cool. But in the road to quantum field theory video for identical particles, I will properly talk about the math. I will properly talk about not just two particle systems but perhaps even up to three um three um, body particle systems but in the end of the day the kicker would be to differentiate between symmetrical and anti-symmetrical wave functions of many body systems um so that will be that and um in part 11 i will start properly diving into the mathematical portions of things. So I will talk about, for example, um, Fourier transform. So we will talk about specifically um, what the Fourier transform is. So there are many types of integral transformations, but the Fourier transform is a very useful one, especially because we're dealing with wave mechanics and things regarding oscillating things and quantum mechanics. But also beyond that, um, you can actually very nicely derive the Heisenberg uncertainty principle principle using Fourier transform. So we will definitely do that as well. And kind of in our um, next part of our uh, road to quantum field theory, so part seven after this one, we will derive the general uncertainty relationship, but mainly using commutators and not using that very fancy integral transformation. We will leave that for part 11. Um, so I look forward to doing that one a lot. And part 12 will be on another mathematical theorem of importance, and that is storm leville theorem and also Green's functions. Green's functions offer you a very powerful tool to solve, um, especially partial differential equations. Um, and storm leville theorem is a very general thing which you learn, especially if you do a maths maths class, is where I actually learned it very recently. Um, but it's a very powerful thing of kind of getting, um, you could say, functions which are self-adjoint, or even if they're not self-adjoint, you can make them self-adjoint and get things being hermetic mission, which you can imagine has a very powerful implication because in quantum mechanics are observables, um, as we will discuss in um, this video and future videos, um, or especially in the next video,
we will discuss that observable observables should be her mission um and this has um some very important things in regards to um what the value for the eigenvalue corresponding with um the operator or the eigenfunction actually would be so um again i'm saying a lot of things but it's basically an important mathematical tool in that respect which all will make sense especially if you come back to watching this after you've already learned the material so that that's for that part. The next part after that will be on complex analysis and mainly I will make a video on contour integration and residue theorem. So particularly we will look at a little bit um, of a quick paced um, intro to complex functions. So we will talk about complex functions for a little bit um, and also mention that while well, you can have complex functions which have these discontinuities basically, a lot of times the discontinuities you'd find are things called poles which are analogous to regular real functions where you have something like 1 over x and the function being undefined at x equals 0 since at x equals 0 that 1 over x function kind of blows up to plus or minus infinity. Um, so in complex functions, you get this same type of thing with poles. Um, so we look at, um, so for example, if you are to integrate over a complex function, so if this is your real axis and this is your imaginary axis, sometimes you have to integrate over a complex function, but there is a pole present there. You can still do this complex integration, so you can still integrate over what is called, um, in jargon, the Riemann surface of this complex complex function is just fanciful way of saying like the surface of the complex function um, by kind of integrating around the whole around that um, pole basically um, through things like the residue theorem so we're gonna see a very handy technique especially for um, for quantum field theory when in the future we talk about things like Feynman propagators so it will be a very useful thing and then finally um the um final parts basically will are going to be i don't know in how many parts i'm going to do it but i'm going to finally start talking about um group theory group theory in the context that it was historically used for particle physics so things like su1 symmetry su2 symmetry some of the so um groups so special orthogonality groups and a lot of those other jargony things um but particularly i will talk about some elements of group theory some elements elements of Lie groups and some elements of representation theory since that seems to be very important, especially later down the road when trying to connect quantum field theory with the standard model. So um, I'm going to try and introduce that because it also helps with just knowing when you hear about it in particle physics context. Um, and then after that, I hope to start tackling some quantum field theory. When it comes to quantum field theory, I wish to tackle the Dirac equation, um, quantizing the Dirac field, spinners, um, also the um, LZ reduction formula, Dyson series, and also Feynman propagators, which you kind of get from the LZ reduction formula, um, and eventually, hopefully, building up to abelian and non-abelian gauge theory. So standard model stuff, which I don't think realistically I'm going to get to because that's already kind of shooting too far. But I hope to at least get to the Dirac equation, like that's the bare minimum, and then maybe eventually build up to quantum electrodynamics, which is the first um, version of quantum field theory, which was properly developed. Um, so I hope to get up till that point, at least with this playlist at the end of the day. So that was a long overview of what we're going to be doing so let's actually get to the doing let's get to some um let's get to some um, poisson brackets and classical mechanics so to start out with our like new part for our road to quantum field theory as i mentioned before we need to look at classical mechanics for a bit and particularly the hamiltonian version of classical mechanics or the hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics or sometimes even called the simplet the symplectic structure of classical mechanics but we won't worry about that particular use of the jargon just the hamiltonian mechanics um to start off well let's start off with something which might be a little bit more familiar to most of 
of you, and that is the Lagrangian formalism of classical mechanics. And I start out by writing the Euler-Lagrange equation, since um, at this point, I imagine you are quite familiar with the Euler-Lagrange equation. I'm using, by the way, um, canonical coordinates instead of um, Cartesian or special coordinates. Um, and what I mean by that jargon is that um, instead of calling this um, Qx, which I could have done, I could have written this as well. Let me just erase this. Um, what I could have also done is called this um, thing, which you're taking the derivative with respect to on the left hand side, x, and this thing right here, v. Um, but if I use q and q dot, then I'm indicating that I'm free to choose whatever types of coordinates that I'm interested in. Um, that's what is called the generalized coordinates or the ge um, canonical coordinates for um, position and velocity. So the Euler-Lagrange equation is something which you have seen and the object itself, the Lagrangian, is some sort of functional which is dependent on q and q dot. Um, functional because it is something which depends itself on functions, but actually we don't even need to worry about that, that little bit of nuance, but I'm just mentioning it for completeness sake. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the total derivative of this thing. So that means that we're going to take d dt of this Lagrangian right here. And what that means is that when we do that, what we get is, well, the both q and q dot it themselves could depend on on um, time, um, because basically this Q could be, for example, in Cartesian way, it could be a function of X. So X of T equals whatever kinematic equation you want to insert in there. And the Q dot can be a function of velocity. V of T can be whatever expression you can want to have in there. So if you're going to take this total derivative, then we better than do it the total derivative way. So that means taking the partial derivative of the Lagrangian, firstly, with respect to Q, and then taking the derivative of q, um, so dq, with respect to t. Uh, and also, on top of this, um, we need to now take the derivative of l with respect to q dot, and then take the derivative of q dot with respect to t. So we have this so far. So far, so good. And by the way, if our um, if our Lagrangian was dependent, for example, instead of just on one canonical coordinate, it was dependent on many other canonical coordinates. So Q1, Q2, all the way to Qn. And for Q dot, it would be Q1 dot, Q2 dot, all the way to Qn dot. Then in essence, what we would have is this similar expression for the total derivative, but the only difference now being that you'd have a summation in front um, for i equals 1 up till n and everything else which we have written in here. But for example, the q's here get an i and the q dots here also get an i, basically. So that's the only thing that would change if um, instead of one canonical coordinate, you'd have multiple canonical coordinates um, for space and um, for basically um, for canonical velocity. So now, in order to clean this thing up, we're going to actually use the Euler-Lagrange equation, since we're going to have to want to substitute for this dl d, dq dot and dl dq. Um, so how we're going to do that is, well, by actually using the definition of the Lagrangian, and that is that it is the kinetic energy minus a given potential energy, where the kinetic energy is the thing that is dependent on q dot, and the potential energy is the thing which is mainly dependent on the spatial bit, so Q. Um, so if we know that, then let's see what happens if we take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to canonical velocity. If we do that, well, we know that the potential itself does not explicitly depend on velocity, so that kind of goes away. And you're mainly taking the derivative then of the kinetic energy with respect to Q dot. Now, if we say that the kinetic energy is expressed in the form which we're mostly familiar with in non-relativistic sense, and that is um, a half mv squared or a half mq dot squared in the case of just generalized velocity, then this is a very easy derivative to take. Basically, you bring the two downstairs and you get that this derivative is equal to mq dot. 
Now, that is actually very familiar if you know your classical mechanics, because at least in this classical mechanics context, um, m times v is exactly the expression for linear velocity, um, so the velocity of something moving along one um, dimension, basically. So we can say that this is something called the canonical momentum, since it is momentum, but expressed um, from basically a canonical velocity, so it's generalized momentum. So this is very nice. And and this is going to help us. Now, to have that same type of neat expression for dl dq, we can do something similar and we can actually plug this value in for basically dl dq dot. We can plug this value in to our Euler Lagrange equation. And if we do that, that means that dl dq is going to be equal to d dt of p. And that is just going to be equal to, well, the um, the time derivative of the canonical or generalized momentum. So we have um, two things right here, which is really cool. We have that um, dl dq gives p dot and that dl dq dot gives p. So let's actually plug this back in here and see what we get. So what we get basically, if we substitute what we just found, is that if we put in dl dq equals um, the time derivative of um, canonical momentum and dl dq dot is just the canonical momentum, what we get is this for the total momentum of our given Lagrangian. And this is very interesting. Um, and perhaps if all of these DDTs kind of confuse you, you can use dot notation for everything. Um, I find dot notation to be a little bit clearer myself Itself, but you do have to be careful if we were taking special relativity into account because then you kind of need to specify what you mean by that dot, that time derivative, because there you have to take into account whose time you're using. But since we're working in the classical framework, then we don't mind. We can just call this p dot q dot plus p q double dot since it's um another time the deriv time derivative of q dot um we get this right here which is pretty cool and um what we can do from here on now is kind of move this thing to the other side which appears to be arbitrary but trust me it makes sense and if we move this thing to the right hand side what we get is um p dot q dot we get this right here um and the reason why i say that it makes sense um or the reason why i say that this is gonna make sense is if now i use um leibniz notation so if i switch back from instead of using these dots to indicate um time derivative i go back to using ddts then what i have here is um ddt um of p q dot um minus well p q dot minus l and um why this is the case is if you were to expand this work this out then if you take the time derivative of p q dot then what you get is you need to use the product rule so you're going to take the derivative of this first multiply by the regular of q dot that's what you have right here. And then plus um, the derivative of q dot, which will be q double dot times the regular of here, which is p. Um, and then because you need to use the sum rule, you have to take the derivative of this and then take the derivative of this. And the derivative of this is just dl dt. Um, so by moving this to the other side, you have the distance equals to zero. And that means basically that whatever this quantity is, this p q dot minus l, well, that thing has to have a derivative which is equal to zero, which makes it special. It means that basically this thing is something that isn't changing regardless of how um, of how many time passes, basically. And this is what is defined in classical mechanics as the Hamiltonian of a system. So P Q dot minus the Lagrangian of that system. And the Hamiltonian is important because it basically gives you actually the total energy of that system. Um, there is a way in which you can prove that the Hamiltonian is equal to the kinetic plus the potential energy, which makes it even more intuitive actually than the Lagrangian. Though deriving it involves a little bit of um, nuances and subtlety. I actually did do the liberty to derive this earlier. Um, like it, it's an exercise in the Taylor's classical mechanics book to kind of derive it. And eventually you 
you do get at the Hamiltonian being equal to T plus U, but it does involve a little bit of like playing around with indices and things like that. So um, if you want to do that, feel free to give it a try, but you don't really have to um, unless you really want to. Now you get that the Hamiltonian is this quantity at which when you take its time derivative, it's equal to zero, at least in a very subtle case at which um, the total time derivative of the Lagrangian we saw earlier is not dependent on um, time explicitly because if it is dependent on time explicitly so if the Lagrangian was dependent on not just q and q dot but also on t then we would have had a third derivative component at which we're taking the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to time but in the case at which the um, total derivative is not explicitly dependent on time at which this is zero then what we get is what we just saw earlier with the total derivative being equal to the results and that this expression for the Hamiltonian holds. Um, so basically, one last little thing which we can do in order to get the so-called Hamilton's equations, which is basically the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to Q and the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to P, like the canonical or generalized momentum, as these will give us this famous um, Hamilton's equations. The last thing we need to do is, well, take note that the Q dot, um, it stands for canonical um, velocity. It can be dependent itself on, um, on Q and P. So it can itself be dependent on, um, it can be itself a function of the canonical um, position and P. Now, you don't have to believe me on this. I can quickly show you why this might be the case. That is, if we have a typical Lagrangian at which it's kinetic energy minus potential energy, well, the kinetic energy might be something like a half mv squared, for example, or q dot squared, minus the potential, which is explicitly dependent on q. Well, instead of it depending explicitly on the mass, it can depend on something which has q in there. So it can depend on some arbitrary function which has q in there. Now that might seem like a stretch, or that is explicitly dependent on q. It might seem like a stretch, but it's definitely not an impossible thing. For example, if instead of placing this as mass, but have it be, for example, mass minus something like x over 2, um, this is very much a possibility which I could have had in there instead of um, it just multiplying by the mass. This might mean basically that as something is moving in the x direction, it's losing mass in accordance to this expression right here, um, in which instead of x, maybe it just place a canonical like spatial coordinate. Um, and if this seems a bit random, it's actually very useful in certain physical conditions. For example, if I have a rocket um, like thrusting, basically, um, it's pushing upwards like this. The rocket actually is losing mass as it continues continues to go upwards in height. So the mass basically of the rocket at H, let's call this H2, is not the same mass of the rocket as H1, as the, it continuously loses mass as it's burning fuel, basically, since the fuel um, contributes to the total mass of this thing. And as it's going upward, it's losing fuel, so it's getting lighter and lighter. This is the whole principle behind how rockets basically work. Um, so you can imagine this not being a stretch of it being something which kind of explicitly depends on the canonical um, spatial um, coordinate. So with that picture in mind, if we take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the canonical um, to the canonical velocity, then we know that again from the pre what we saw previously that this term right here is going to be zero because the derivative of this thing is going to be zero as it doesn't explicitly depend on the canonical velocity. But this one does, um, and what it gives us is in this case, um, bring the two down. This half goes away. You get a q times q dot and we know that this is supposed to be equal to the canonical momentum um so what this tells us is that we can express the canonical um velocity so q dot as the canonical momentum over a q whatever arbitrary function you have basically um that is in the kinetic energy term so this means that q dot can be expressed 
as some function of um, dependent on the generalized momentum and um, Q, the generalized spatial coordinate. So that's basically how I came to the conclusion that, well, Q dot itself can be dependent on um, P and Q. So what this means is if I were to write my Lagrangian again, then it would be P Q dot, that is itself dependent on P and Q, minus L Q Q dot, in which the Q dot itself depends on Q and p. So this would be the expression I'd have for my modified, you could say, um, Hamiltonian. Now we said earlier that in order to get Hamilton's equations of motion, we have to take the derivative of this um, Hamiltonian with respect to p and with respect to q. So let's actually do that. Um, let's take his derivative firstly with respect to q, shall we? So we'll take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the canonical um, spatial coordinate. And what this means is that we have to take the derivative of this with respect to q. We know that p doesn't explicitly depend on q, so it's just the derivative of q dot. So in this case, it's mainly going to be del q dot with respect to del q, as it explicitly depends on q right here minus, so now when we take the derivative of this, we are going to have to do some chain ruling and product ruling, basically, because we have to take the derivative of L firstly, explicitly with respect to Q, so DL DQ, but also we have to take the derivative of L now with respect to Q dot, as Q dot itself is a function which depends on Q. So this is kind of like this chain ruling bit which is involved right here. We have to take also the derivative of L with respect to Q dot and then the derivative of Q dot with respect to um, Q, basically. That gives us this right here. But we're not done. We can kind of clean things up a little bit. As a matter of fact, by using the Euler-Lagrange equation result, which we know earlier, we know that dl dq dot is equal to p. If you don't recall that exactly, you can just rewind a little bit and see the part in which we talked about um, the Euler-Lagrange equation and how that gives you p and p dot. So if we have that and we put that in there, we have p times dq, dq dot dq, minus this term right here, and minus this right here. Now, these two terms are the same, so they kind of cancel each other out, leaving you with um, this right here is equal to minus dl dq. But hold up, we've also seen that this thing right here is also equal to something um, using the Euler-Lagrange equation. It is equal to the time derivative of the generalized momentum. So in general, then, we can write basically that this um, derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to Q is equal to P dot. Um, which, if you just multiply things by minus 1, so you can say basically that P dot is equal to minus the derivative of um, the Hamiltonian with respect to the canonical spatial coordinate. This is the first um, equation of Hamilton. So this is the first Hamilton's equation of motion. You can get the second one in a very similar spirit by doing this same thing, but the derivative now being with respect to P. So let's just do that. So to do the same thing which we just did um, with the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to Q, let's do that now with respect to P. If we were to do that, if we look at this first term right here, well, um, what we're going to get is, um, well, we're going to have to kind of take a product rule type of thing right here um, because um, you have this thing depending on P, but you also have a P right here. So let's do a simple product rule. That's going to be the derivative of this thing first um, times the derivative of this. That's just going to be Q dot plus the derivative of now P times um, Q dot um, with respect to P. So that's going to be derivative of Q dot with respect to P. So that's going to be this particular term right here. And um, now for the Lagrangian bit, we're going to have to take now the derivative only of the Lagrangian with respect to Q dot and then times the derivative of Q dot with respect to P. Since um, there's only the one thing here in the Lagrangian which really does depend on P, um, at least implicitly. So um, that's going to be DL 
dq dot and by chain rule dq dot um the p so that's what we have right here and we can substitute again um using the results from euler lagrange equation if you don't remember it just rewind a little bit backwards and you'll see that we found that this was equal to the canonical momentum um so putting that back in there we find basically to have q dot plus p d q dot dp minus p d q dot dp i know i'm a bit lax with using curly like dels and d's but they're kind of the same thing um so basically because you have the two of the same terms right here they cancel each other out and what you're left with is that d h dp is equal to q dot and this is the second um hamilton's equation of motion so these two equations of motion so both q dot d being equal to this and p dot being equal to minus dh dq well these are both very important results from um hamilton hamiltonian mechanics from this particular formulation of um classical mechanics which came a little bit later than the lagrangian formalism but it's really handy and we will see why because it will lead to the thing which i've been alluding to which is the poisson brackets now to title that picture of like hamilton's equations with this new concept which i'm going to introduce soon um let's introduce a random dynamical variable so if we have have a dynamical variable called a which depends on um, the canonical spatial position and the canonical momentum um, by the way um, dynamical variable is a fancy way of just a variable basically um, which you would uh, measure in classical mechanics so something like momentum something like energy something like position um, which can all depend on some combination of q and p um, if we take the total derivative of this thing, so the total derivative being taking dA with respect to dt, then what we're going to get um, is basically we have to do some chain ruling and some product ruling of this thing. So we're going to first take the derivative of um, A with respect to Q and then take the derivative of Q with respect to time. This is simply by rule of multivariable um, chain ruling, basically. Um, as we're seeing that Q and P explicitly depend on time, each of them. Um, so that's why we have to do this chain ruling thing. And so now we do the same thing, dA, d as in this case P, and then take the derivative of P with respect to time. So this is nice and dandy, but we can what we can see immediately from this is that we have q dot right here, and we also have p dot right here. And we just saw that q dot was equal to um del like the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to um p and p dot was equal to the Hamiltonian's derivative with respect to q with a minus sign in front of it. So knowing this, we can substitute both these expression into this total derivative for this dynamical variable A right here. And what this tells us is that we get that it is the partial derivative of A with respect to Q. And now um, put in this Hamiltonian thing right here, minus um, the derivative, partial derivative of A with respect to P um times the partial derivative of hamiltonian with respect to so basically substituting for this um dp dt putting in minus dh dq gave us this expression right here um and this is very interesting um because it is this weird combination of the derivatives of a and the derivatives of h basically and in a more abstract and compact notation this can be written as a curly bracket um a comma h 
This is called the anti-commutator or also the Poisson bracket. Um, and you can take it not just between these two um, dynamical variables where the Hamiltonian itself also is a dynamical variable, by the way, same as um, this one is, but you can take it between any other arbitrary dynamical variables. So for example, if we were to, um, because this seems, I would imagine, quite a bit abstract. So the mechanism of using this Poisson bracket is that if I have two arbitrary dynamical variables, so q1, q2, I first take the derivative of q1 with respect to a canonical position, then times the um, partial derivative of q2 with respect to a canonical momentum, and now minus, again, the derivative of q1, but this time with respect to canonical momentum, times, I don't have enough space, unfortunately, but q2, times um, the derivative of, with respect to q this time. So it's kind of um, doing derivative of q1 with respect to q and derivative of q2 with respect to p and then minus sign and switching the thing around. So this is kind of the mechanism of how it works. But in case this feels very likely weird, which I imagine it probably does, let's try and do it for um, the commutator between the position x and the Hamiltonian and see if we get something rather familiar out of this. So let's calculate this and see what we get. Um, so if we use the same formula, the same mechanism, then we do dx dq. In this case, the canonical, it's not a canonical coordinate. Um, we just say that the coordinate is Cartesian, so it is x. Um, and then um, do basically dh d um p minus dx sorry minus dx dp times dh dx um now we know immediately that x does not depend on p so this term right here is zero making this thing go away um and the only thing that survives basically um is uh whoops the only thing that survives basically is this term right here and the derivative d dx dx is just equal to one so we're mainly left basically with um dh dp but not only that we can actually see what this dh dp is because we know that the hamiltonian is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy and the kinetic energy in classical mechanics is equal to a half mv squared plus some random potential energy, but it can also be written as p squared over 2m. If you don't believe me, you can just substitute what p stands for, so p equals mv, square the thing, so having the square of this and putting it back in there, you'd pretty much arrive at this expression right here. Or you pretty much arrive from here to here, basically. So yeah, having this right here means that we can finally now differentiate with respect to p, since we have p squared um, over 2m. So if we differentiate the Hamiltonian with respect to p, that means that we bring the 2 down. Um, so we pretty much left with um, 2p over 2m. So just p over m, which is nice um, because um, what this stands for is actually velocity. Um, if you put in um, p equals mv, then the m's kind of um, cancel out. So if you have mv over m, these m's cancel out, and you're left with v. This is really interesting. You get the velocity by taking the um, Poisson bracket of position with the Hamiltonian. Um, let's see if we can do something else and find some other interesting properties. What if we do the Poisson bracket of position with momentum? Now, if we do that, and if we use the same mechanism of before, so dx, dx, now dp, dp minus dx dp and dp dx, we can immediately know for um, that both of these terms are going to be zero. So this whole thing goes to zero because x does not depend on p, and nor does p depend on x. Um, so what you're left with is dx over dx, dp over dp. Both of these things are equal to one. So the Poisson bracket of this actually gives you one.
Now, again, this is rather interesting and intriguing for latter reasons, which we will see soon, but keep this in mind. Um, and you can do this for many other types of things. So, for example, I did some on my paper, which unfortunately is a bit scrambled. Apologize for that. But, for example, if you do the Poisson bracket of two canonical positions, but with different, say, indices, um, then what you get is zero after working it out. Um, and if you do it for um, a canonical position and a canonical momentum, but the indices being different, then what you get is actually a Kronecker delta, um, which you can work out nicely. If you do this right here, you actually find a Kronecker um, tensor. And if you contract those, then you get a Kronecker delta. So stuff from um, our first and second road to quantum field theory kind of comes nicely back into play right here. Um, but at the end of the day, if you recall correctly, we obtained this Poisson bracket thing by trying to look at what the total derivative is of any um, dynamical variable um, with respect to t, basically. And we found that that was equal to the, um, the Poisson bracket of the dynamical variable with the Hamiltonian. And this conclusion can be made in general, that if I have a dynamical variable, um, if I take its total derivative, then it is equal to the Poisson bracket. It is abstract, but it tells you something about whether this, um, this variable or this dynamical variable is a conserved quantity. For example, if um, this conserved quantity was dp dt, then um, it is equal to the Poisson bracket of p h, and we can work this out if you want. This would be dp dx d um h d p minus d x sorry d p d p times d h d x we know that d p d p is equal to one we know that d p d x is equal to zero so the only thing that, that is going to survive this d p d t is going to be the second term right here, which is minus dh dx. And actually, if we look at what um, the Hamiltonian again stands for, so h equals t plus u, then u is the only thing which would explicitly depend on x. So it's the only thing which you'll take the derivative of. So this means that dh dx is equal to minus du dx. So you get minus du dx right here. This should be familiar to you. This is actually Newton's second law. Um, so you just obtained that the um, basically the total net force on a given object in a, um, is given by the change in the momentum and is also equal to minus the change in the potential energy. So you kind of obtain Newton's second law through this um, Poisson bracket thing right here, which is incredibly amazing if you ask me. Um, so this is why the statement used about dynamical variables is so powerful. You can use it to find other expressions like this um, between when finding the anti-commutator between some dynamical variable and the Hamiltonian. Now this Poisson bracket is actually surprisingly um, similar to what is known as the commutator in quantum mechanics. So the Poisson bracket, you saw that if it's between any two um, dynamical um, variables, then it is derivative like right here, I'm just gonna write the full thing out. It is this right here. So this combination of a thing, but with derivatives. Now in quantum mechanics, you have something similar, but one of the postulates of quantum mechanics, one of the few postulates that you have in quantum mechanics that is basically imposed onto the theory because it works really well with experiments is that dynamical variables are promoted to operators. Now, further justification for that statement can be made if by knowing some more deep mathematical theorems like the sturm liouville theorem. But again, that, as I mentioned earlier in the video, will be left for one of the future parts of our road to quantum field theory, part 11, most likely. Um, so 
the further the best justification I can give right now is that because of a process called first quantization, at which basically you do a series of steps to make your um classical um to make your classical dynamical variables into quantum operators so that you can actually do um things in the fashion which Heisenberg did them for matrix mechanics. Um some one of the many things which you do is turn these dynamical variables into operators. So you turn this Q1, Q2 into a matrix, basically, instead of just this scalar value thing. Um, and turning them into a matrix means that this commutator thing is slightly different than this anti-commutator. What the commutator does is um, it has this similar thing in which you have Q1, Q2 minus Q, Q1, U2, Q2 right here, but it's slightly different. It is, um, the way it looks is the following. You have Q1, Q2 with hats minus Q2, Q1 with hats. Um, and name you that these are matrices. Q1 is a matrix. Q2 is also a matrix. So this is a matrix multiplication thing technically written right here. And what the commutator in essence tells you is um, whether if you have a matrix, say Q1, acting on some vector, so let's say this is some arbitrary column vector, um, whether that acting on the vector and then being acted upon by some Q2, um, which would act upon this thing right here, whether this is the same as this Q2 first acting on this vector, so this Q2 first multiplying this vector, if you've done linear algebra, which I hope you have a background in, then you know about matrix multiplication to vectors. It kind of linearly transforms the vector into another type of vector. Um, so it creates a new vector. Um, what the commutator does is it, it asks basically if Q1 acting on the vector and then being acted upon by Q2 is the same as Q2 acting on the vector and then all of that being acted upon by Q1. It asks if the order at which you do this matrix multiplication matters. And in quantum mechanics, a lot of times the fundamental results is that it definitely does does. The order really, really does matter. So that is one of the key differences between the Poisson brackets and the commutator. The other one is crucial, and that is that basically quantum mechanics should generalize at the end of the day to classical mechanics. Since at the end of the day, it should be a theory which describes our actual world. And at the end of the day, still, when you're doing measurements with the apparatus, um, you are measuring things using um, things which depend on classical things, like, for example, a voltmeter or other things which basically are just functioning using classical mechanics. So these quantum mechanical properties should at the end of the day boil down to classical mechanics. And it actually does. Um, the commutator actually does boil down to the Poisson bracket almost um, immediately. So it almost boils down to the Poisson bracket of two dynamical variables, so classical dynamical variables, so not operators in this case with Poisson brackets. The only thing is that you need to grab whatever number you got out of the commutator and divide it by one over i h bar. Um, and the reasoning for this i one over mine one over i h bar has to do with again more deep mathematical nuances, which perhaps we will definitely talk about in um, the further videos to come. This means that, for example, in the case at which I have um, the Poisson bracket of X and P, which we saw to be equal to one, then the quantum mechanical equivalent of that, since it needs to boil down to this, is that one over I H bar commutator of X hat, P hat, is equal to one. And this means that multiplying both sides in this case by IH bar gives you this right here. And it tells you something that is deeply different about quantum mechanics versus classical mechanics. And that is that in the case of quantum mechanics, um, X and P do not commute. So, and um, without the jargon, this is saying that whether you measure the position first and then the momentum or vice versa, it changes the results of whatever it is you're measuring. So um, it changes the results by some amount, 
by what amount by ih bar basically and this actually leads very nicely into the uncertainty principle but i will leave that for our next video on our road to quantum field theory so the main key point is the are these two things right here the Poisson bracket for dynamical variables, especially for X and P, since that's very popular, but we will keep seeing, especially the commutator popping by a lot. And of course, well, the commutator itself, besides the Poisson bracket and this IH bar, especially. Um, so yeah, I hope basically that that was as clear as I could have made it to be. I hope that video was informative for you guys. I try my best to break down every nitty gritty detail about both the Poisson brackets or the anti-commutators, if you will, and the commutators. Um, so the commutators, you can kind of get an intuitive feeling of as being this thing, which tells you whether or not A times B in case of matrix multiplication is the same as B times A. So whether or not the thing commutes. Um, the anti-commutator is a little bit less, you could say, intuitive in that sense, but it can be seen as this thing which tells you something about the time evolution of a dynamical variable. So it tells you whether your dA dt, so whatever that a might be, whether it is x, v, um, p, something else, whatever else, uh, h, whatever else it may be, it tells you how it evolves through time and you can find the commutator basically by writing out the expression which you saw for the Poisson bracket fully um, and it can yield some interesting results like we did find with Newton's second law and beyond that if you want a little bit of a sneak peek for the future um, the thing which we found which was um, which were actually Hamilton's equations of motion has a quantum mechanical equivalent even which is called the Heisenberg equation of motion and it looks very much very similar to what we just found for the Poisson bracket but instead of it being a derivative of a dynamical variable with respect to time it will be a time derivative of an operator with respect to time since it has something to do with um, something known as pictures of quantum mechanics and these have to do with whether or not you consider the actual eigenfunction so the state functions as the thing which is changing through time or the operators themselves so the things that are acting on the state functions as changing through time and in the Heisenberg picture you consider for one at least the observables so the um, operators to themselves depend on time and that's why you need an equation of motion to describe them and that will be Heisenberg's equation of motion which pretty much has the exact same form as um, the as to basically Hamilton's equations of motion or what you get basically with the Poisson brackets but only this time with commutators so that is something to look forward to at least don't worry if you didn't get it now but it's something which you can kind of imagine makes even closer connection to of classical mechanics to quantum mechanics at least by viewing or by inspection by looking at the equations and just eyeballing it and it seeming very similar um though there are of course nuances both in the mathematics and just physically as well as to what each of them entails which we will continue to explore in our further road to quantum field theory stay tuned for more content and i hope to see you guys of course very soon Bye bye